Today we're going to finish the book of Judges chapter 13 and move into Judges chapter 14. And as I said, unbelievably, we're going to see this man, Samson, little son. Remember his name, Samson, comes from a word that means son, Shemesh. So the little son, the one of great strength, the one given great privilege and great authority, we're going to see just how quickly he can make a disaster of his life. In Judges chapter 13, because we need to start somewhere, in Judges chapter 13, verse 3, look at what the Bible says. This was Samson's beginning. Even before he's born, God has chosen an unborn son to be the next judge of Israel, to be the leader that would begin to cast off this Philistine oppression. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman. This is Samson's mother, the woman. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and he said to her, Behold now, you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. God is calling out the next leader of Israel before he's born. You can't get any more privileged than this. Look what it says later in the chapter in fulfillment to this promise that God makes because when God makes a promise, He always keeps them. A barren woman who's had no children. In Judges chapter 13, verse 24, the scripture says, Then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson. And the child grew up and the Lord blessed him. So he's picked by God even before he's born. He's picked by God. He's got privilege, all the privilege of anybody who's ever lived. I can't imagine anybody being more privileged, at least at this stage in the Bible, up to Judges chapter 13, picked by God from before he was even uh, made by mom and dad, picked to be the leader of Israel. Great opportunity to be a hero in Israel. One lifted up from birth. A personal choice of God. Samson was the one. Samson was the one that God wanted to move Israel out of this oppression of the Philistines. Samson was chosen by God. What more would you want? What better head start in life can you get than what Samson had? Surely, as we look at these early verses, surely this man of all men in Israel, surely this man, Born under such a a silver-lined cloud, surely this man will worship Yahweh alone. Surely this man will bow the knee to only Yahweh and worship Yahweh according to the Mosaic law, according to what God wants. Surely this guy. And what we see as we start turning the pages of Scripture is, no, not this guy either. In Judges chapter 13, verse 25, look at the next line in the book. Judges 13, verse 25, And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Menachem Adan. This is his his hometown between Zorah and Eshtaol. So we see here that God the Holy Spirit, the angel of the Lord who came to speak to his mother is God the Son, before he became Jesus Christ. And now we have the third person of the Godhead, God the Holy Spirit involved in Samson's life. The Father chose him from before he was even uh, uh, made by mom and dad, made, you know what I mean. Uh, God the Son comes to tell the mother, you will have a child. And now God the Holy Spirit comes along, comes alongside Samson, an Old Testament endowment, right? Didn't enter Samson, but comes alongside him. What more does Samson need to succeed in this life? You think he has it all. Surely he will make it. Surely he will be a great success story in the people of Israel, in the story of Israel. And we keep reading and we find out somehow, somehow, the heart of Samson was enough to overpower All the privilege and opportunity in God the Holy Spirit that endued him, walked alongside him. So God the Holy Spirit begins to empower Samson to begin to deliver Israel. Uh, This word, uh, stir, it says the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. Uh, The word pa'a, this is what it means to stir a person's feelings so as to summon into action. Uh, Stir one another up to love and good works. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, stir one another up. Uh, to stir a person's feelings. I don't mean feeling as, as emotion. 
Uh, I just mean to stir somebody up. This is what the definition was, so I wrote it as it was. But we're not talking emotions and feelings as much as we're talking about thoughts. We're talking about Samson starting to see things the way God sees them. Samson has to see Israel's situation the way that God sees Israel's situation in order to be a successful judge. And that's the problem with Samson, at least part of the problem. Here he has God himself, God the Holy Spirit, stirring him to summon him, summon him into action, and it seems to have no effect on this guy. So God the Holy Spirit here, a couple of thoughts. God the Holy Spirit is stirring Samson to see things the way God sees them. He has to understand the situation accurately. These are the things that God sees in Israel. This is why God has raised Samson, why Samson is going to be the next, the last great judge of Israel here, great in the sense of uh, popular, everybody knows his name. This is the way God sees the situation in Israel. Israel is in idolatry and God is punishing her. That's what's going on. They are worshiping false gods. And God is punishing her. God has determined, though, that now, after many years of Philistine punishment, Philistines are a Gentile nation, they're not Jews, and God has allowed the Philistines in Israel to have power over Israel to punish her because Israel won't worship God properly. So God has determined it's time for the punishing nation, the Philistines, to be punished for their hatred of Israel. And he's raising up Samson to do that. But Samson has to understand this in order to be effective in his mission. God has raised up Samson to begin this process, and God the Holy Spirit will be Samson's guide and support on this mission, the mission to cast off the Philistines. Will Samson do it? God the Holy Spirit gives the power to accomplish acts for God. Uh, now there's, there's something to be said here. What we see in Samson's life is his sin nature, his flesh, his own desires, his own lusts, uh, his need for gratification. We see all of that lumped up against God the Holy Spirit. And what we see in Samson's life is that his flesh and his sin natures and his desires for gratification win. So the point is, just because you have God the Holy Spirit, and Christian, I'll say the same thing to you. Just because you have God the Holy Spirit living inside you forever doesn't mean you'll accomplish what He wants you to accomplish in this life. You can fail just as badly as Samson did. So can I. God the Holy Spirit isn't a rubber stamp that says that means when I have God the Holy Spirit, I cannot fail. Everything I touch will turn to gold. That's not what the Bible teaches. What we see in the life of Samson is that he has to have an act of free will. He has to choose to accomplish what God the Holy Spirit wants to do through him. So God the Holy Spirit gives the power. You'll see in Samson's life many acts of strength, great human physical strength. The Holy Spirit gives the power to accomplish acts for God, but... There has to be cooperation by Samson, an exercise of his human free will. He has to choose to let God work. He has to choose to let God work. The same is true for us. Does the New Testament say that we as Christians can grieve God the Holy Spirit? Yes, it does. Does it say that we can quench, even put out the, the fire, like taking a bucket of water and throwing it on the fire power source of God, the Holy Spirit? Does the New Testament say that Christians can quench the Holy Spirit? Yes, it does. Just because we have God, the Holy Spirit, doesn't mean we're going to succeed spiritually. And we see that in the life of Samson. Now, Old Testament and New Testament, God the Holy Spirit relationship is entirely different. I, I won't say much about it because I know you probably all know it. I've taught it before several times. I know you've been taught it before I came. In the Old Testament, God the Holy Spirit didn't come to live inside anyone like He does now. 
the mystery, God, Christ in you, God, the Holy Spirit in us. The Bible teaches very clearly in this age in which we live, God, the Holy Spirit is in us. But in the Old Testament, He came alongside people. He endued them. He didn't indwell them. So what he's doing in Samson's life is different than what he does in our life, but it's still God the Holy Spirit. And so we see this, this problem uh, in Samson's life because just because Samson has uh, one more thought, just because Samson has God the Holy Spirit come alongside him to strengthen him and guide him does not guarantee success. He's been chosen by the Father from before his inception. He's been given every benefit of having positive to God parents, wonderful, godly, Jewish remnant parents who bow the knee to Yahweh, guides in life. And still that's no guarantee of success for, for Samson. He's been, here he's been given God the Holy Spirit that comes alongside him, and still that's no guarantee for spiritual success in Samson's life. The bottom line is, friends, for Samson and for each of us, we have to choose. We have to choose whether we will let God work or whether we won't. Um, another fact, Samson, I just alluded to this, Samson has obedient parents. He's got a good mother and a good father. His mother is better than his father in the spiritual sense. Very true today, unfortunately, but his mother uh, is, and his father are part of this wonderful Jewish remnant. While all of Israel is in idolatry, while God is punishing Israel because they're worshiping these false gods, here you have uh, Manoach and his wife who's unnamed. We have the parents of Samson following Yahweh, worshiping the one true God, Yahweh. Talk about privilege. He's been brought up in a home with people that love the only God that's ever existed, Yahweh. I mean, you just keep adding to what God gave Samson and you think there's no way this man will turn away from God. There's no possible chance. And that's exactly what you see in his life. It's just so sad. His parents are part of the godly Jewish remnant. Again, his mother, as we'll see more so than his dad. Another fact, uh, Samson was different than the other judges. What we'll see in Samson is not a leader a military leader who leads a military army. He's not a gatherer of the Jewish army to go in and mass against this Philistine force. There's not going to be a great war like we saw with Gideon and his 300. You're not going to see that in Samson. He doesn't lead an army like that. As a matter of fact, he doesn't lead an army at all. Uh, Samson is a very different leader. Uh, so why is it that God doesn't through Samson? Here's a question for you. Why is it that God through Samson doesn't raise up a military leader to lead a, an army of tens of thousands of men to destroy the Philistine army? Why doesn't God do that? Remember the cycle of the book of Judges? Israel goes into idolatry, worships false gods. What happens after that? God punishes them for their idolatry. In this case, He brings the Philistines against God. And what's the third thing that happens? That after a point in time, after a number of years have gone by, Israel finally says, Enough, Lord, please, please save us from this, these oppressors. And the fourth thing is God will answer and raise up a judge to do exactly that. What you don't have in Israel during the book of Samson, during the time of Samson, is Israel calling out for God to save them from the Philistines. Israel is completely numb to the oppression of the Philistines. Israel has grown comfortable living in a pagan, ungodly, idolatrous society. They don't mind it. They've gone from being a people chosen by God to live a very distinct life on this earth and they have totally been washed by pagan Baalism and the Asherah and all the false gods, Molech, Dagon, uh, uh, all of the false gods of the, uh, of the pagan nations in Canaan. And they're totally comfortable. They don't have any problem being an ungodly nation. 
And I spoke last week about America, and I'll only make this one comment. We are seeing our neighbors have no problem living in an ungodly pagan nation. They don't have a problem that America started as a, as a godly nation 200 years ago. They don't have a problem that all, all that's being washed away, that we're washing God out of our schools, out of our courthouses, out of every place we can wash God out. We are taking bleach and erasing God from our places. Most of the people we live around just don't care. As long, hey, as long as they get their paycheck, as long as they have their car to drive, as long as they live in the house they want, as long as they have the clothes they want, as long as their kids can do all the extra stuff that they want the kids to do, everything's all right. Let me ask you a question. Is everything all right? Is everything all right in our country when everything we're doing is trying to erase God from our heritage? But we've become comfortable and some even in the church. It's no big deal, I couldn't care less. Really? The light of the world? The Christian in America? Couldn't care less about what's going on? Really? The reflector of the love of Jesus Christ? <clears throat> Not the proper response to what's going on. And Samson in the Jews in Israel... We're totally comfortable. Why would God raise up an army to kill the Philistines? It's not what they wanted. It has to, uh, I don't want to go any further with that. Uh, but uh, just understand what I said. Our nation is in this turmoil that Israel was in in the book of Judges chapter 13 also. Israel's not crying out to God to save them. The only reason God raises up Samuel, I mean Samson, excuse me, the only reason God raises up Samson is to stop the Philistines from, from rising up even further in their oppression of Israel. So what do we have in Samson? Not this war leader, not this great military leader as we've seen before in Yiftah and the other people that came along, Jephthah. What we have in Samson, uh, and I hate to say it because it sounds so bad, but it's true in my mind, it's perfectly clear. What we have in this guy is a clown. He's a distraction. And what God raises up through Samson is a one-man distraction to the Philistines. And Yahweh is doing this to keep more serious attacks of the Philistines from happening. He just raises up Samson. Here, y'all follow Samson for a minute. You Philistines focus on Samson and his idiocy for a while, his clowniness, his, his clownliness. I won't let you destroy Israel any further. I'm beginning to destroy you, Philistines. And he's starting by just letting Samson be this one-man distraction. He would use God, as we'll see, will use Samson's foolishness and Samson's bad decisions to save Israel. Really? God can use a man's bad decisions? He can weave our bad, foolish decisions into his plan? to further a, a something that he wants to do? Well, of course he does. He does it every day. Let me ask you this question. Here's an aside, but it's a good question. If God could only use you when you were not being foolish, how much time would he have to use you in this lifetime? If he could only use men and women on this earth who were pure and perfect, and not foolish from time to time. Who could he use? Nobody is the answer. Of course God's plan deals with infidelity in the relationship, unfaithfulness on man's part. Of course God's plan has to roll over our foolish decisions, allow us to make foolish decisions, and author into his plan. I know Samson, instead of fighting against the Philistines, I know this particular clown is going to marry a Philistine. I've raised him from before birth. I've chosen him to cast off 
the, the reins of the Philistines. But what does he do instead? He joins them wholeheartedly. Not only is he comfortable living among them, he wants to be one of them and marry one of their daughters. He, he marries a Philistine. And God uses that foolishness because that's what God, God wanted the Philistines to be stirred up and to start these battles. And God uses Samson's foolishness to further his plan. I assure you, in my life, God has used bad decisions that I have made to further His plan in my life. Through His grace and more so through His mercy, He has used dumb things I have done to move me from places where I was to places where He needed me. He said, you want to do it the hard way, we can do that too, Rick. I will move you. Uh, and sometimes it was through, uh, a lot of times, it was through just bonehead decisions that I made. Foolish decisions. Of course God has to use the fool. Uh, who else would he use? Samson. Another fact to keep in mind, the 40 years, the Philistines will oppress Israel for 40 years and not until the end of, uh, or not until Samuel comes along, not Samson, but Samuel after him, do, uh, do the Philistines start to really be defeated in large numbers. I want to show you a couple of verses, and then we'll move into Judges 14. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 and 13. This is future. This is after the Judges. The book of Samuel uh, comes after, and this is what it says. Samuel after he's defeated some Philistines, this is what he says. Samuel took a stone and he set it between Mitzpah and Shane and he named it Ebenezer. Have you ever heard that name, that word, Ebenezer? Ebenezer. Ebenezer Scrooge. Uh, there's a song that we sing, Come Thou Fount. Uh, I know in some hymnals, Come Thou Fount has a, uh, has a change in the words, but the way the author wrote it is, Here I raise mine Ebenezer. I don't know if in our book it's been changed because nobody knows what an Eben Ezer is. An Eben Ezer. No, it is. Verse 2, Here I raise mine Eben Ezer. Hither by thy help I am come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Why would Samson use this word? Uh, let's read the verse and then I'll tell you. Samson took a stone. And he named the stone Aben Azer. Aben is the word for stone, Evan, E B E N, and Azer is helper. So it's a stone of help. That's what this stone is. It's the stone of help. And he says the helper is God. The stone is representing his, his God. Thus far, Yahweh the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines, I'm telling you about Samuel defeating the Philistines. So the Philistines were subdued and they did not come anymore within the border of Israel. And the hand of Yahweh was against the Philistine all the days of Samuel. Samuel, Aben Azer, here I raise mine Aben Azer, my stone of help. The hymn writer is saying, so far in life God has brought me safely to this point. So I raise a stone of remembrance to God here, a stone of help. And I know that God will take me home one day. He'll, he'll continue doing what he's done and take me home. Aben Azer, this is where they get the word. David would complete the defeat of the Philistines. I've just got to show you the history so you'll know that Samson didn't complete anything. Really didn't even start it. In his death, the very last act that Samson will do, remember the story, is that he pushes apart those two pillars. He's been captured by the Philistines. They've gouged out his eyes, so he's blind, he's helpless, he's, a dis he's just a destroyed judge. And Samson will push those pillars out, and the, the area, the place, the building where all these 3,000 Philistines in will be crushed and kill 3,000 people and also kill Samson. And immediately after that, it says, in his death, Samson killed more Philistines than he did in his life. He didn't, he's not a great military leader. That's not who he is. That's not why God raised him. Samuel does some of the destroying to the Philistines. And not until David comes along are they finally destroyed. Look what it says. 
I'll read you two verses. I just have one. No, here they are. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? If you read 2 Samuel, if you read the life of David, the Philistines were always giving David trouble. Even when he was a youth, there was a certain Philistine that gave David trouble. Who am I thinking of? One Philistine, a giant. The David and the Philistines is a theme that goes throughout David's life until we get to this point. And finally, God allows the destruction of the Philistines. So David uh, inquired of Yahweh and he asked, God, shall I go up? Shall I fight against the Philistines? Will you give me success? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. It is time for the Philistines to finally be destroyed. And so in verse 25 of the same chapter, then David did so just as the Lord had commanded him. And he struck down the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. So David is the one who would finally destroy the Philistines. So we have this life of Samson. It's a very odd life that God brings up. And Samson is the one who's raised up to begin the destruction of the Philistines. But as we'll see over and over, all he does is... Not good things. Look at Judges chapter 14, verse 1. It says, Then Samson, here's our judge. How old is he? I don't know. Uh, 20? Something? I, I have no idea. I would guess he's a young man. Samson went down to Timnah. Let me just show you a map very quickly. This is where we're talking about the southern coastal part of, uh, of Israel, the Philistine area, along the Mediterranean Sea coast there. Uh, Timnah is in the, in the, I think I put a star here. Yeah, right there, that white star. This is about where Timnah is on the edge of the Judean hillside. And this is where Samson goes. It's Philistine territory. Don't lose sight of that fact. This is where the Philistines live. And this is where Samson goes, to where the Philistines are. Samson went down to Timnah and he saw a woman. Uh-oh. He saw a woman in Timnah, and it says, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, what does God say to, the, to Samson's mother? What does the angel of the Lord say? I'm going to raise up a son through you who will begin to destroy the Philistines. What does Samson do instead? He sees a pretty one, and he wants her. A Philistine. The things that Samson does are unbelievable unbelievably brash in his, uh, his sins against God. Unbelievably brash. So he came back. He sees this woman, unnamed. He sees this woman in Timnah, this area of the Philistines, a daughter of the Philistine, a Gentile, a non-Jew. He came back and he told his father and his mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me as a wife. He says this because in that day and age, uh, arranged marriages are the way people got married. A man didn't go up to a woman and start a relationship with her and ask her to marry him. It was mother and father and mother and father, the bride and groom, or the bride's mom and dad, the groom's mom and dad. They came to an agreement. They're the ones that made the decision. I wish it were still so. No, I'm kidding. And they're the ones that made the deal. I'll give you my daughter and this many sheep, this many whatever, if you will take her in marriage, the dowry, the Old Testament dowry. So that's why Samson is asking his mother and father to do this. This was the culture of the day. So Samson says, I have chosen my own wife. I didn't wait for you and mom and dad to do it. I have chosen her. You go do it. Is that honoring his father and his mother according to the Mosaic law? No. Uh, Another question, was there anything wrong with Samson wanting to marry a non-Jew? Why am I pushing the fact that she was a Gentile, a Philistine, a non-Jew? What's the big deal? Well, it's not a big deal unless you want to follow what God says in the Bible. And if you want to live according to what God says in the Bible, then it is a big deal. Look at what it says in the Bible concerning intermarriage. In Exodus 34... When God is giving the Ten Commandments to Moses and all the laws to Moses, in Exodus 34, verse 16, he says, this is the fear, this is the danger of intermarrying with a non-Jew Yahweh-worshipping woman. 
you might take some of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters might play the harlot with their gods, the false gods, and cause your sons, your Jewish sons, also to play the harlot with their gods. You can't intermarry with the Gentiles. You won't bring them into the worship of Yahweh. They'll take you away from the worship of Yahweh. And again in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3, furthermore, Moses says, furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. This is a command. You shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. So why is it a big deal that Samson is marrying, wants to marry a Philistine, Gentile, non-Jewish woman? Because God says, don't do it. That's why it's a big deal. According to the Mosaic law, a Jew had to marry a Jew within their own tribe. And so here we see this great man, Samson, man of great privilege, doing from the very beginning verses of what we hear Samson do in his life, doing everything against what God wants him to do. Totally brash. Samson wants gratification. He sees a pretty woman. No doubt this was a beautiful daughter of the Philistines. He doesn't care that she's an unbeliever. I mean, do you have daughters trying to get married today? Do you have sons trying to get married? Grandchildren that are thinking about getting married, looking for a spouse, looking for a partner? Uh, not a partner in that sense, a spouse. A man and a woman is what I'm talking about. Are they living? Are they, are they, are, have they made a list according to God's Word and what God wants for them? Or do they really... It really doesn't matter. I, I just I saw her. She's got a great personality. She's pretty. Oh, Dad, you're going to love her. And my question is going to be, but son, does she know the living God? And if she doesn't, what are you doing? What are you doing? And that's exactly what Samson's response to his son, is, or Samson's parents' response to their son is about to be, kid, what are you doing? You're living and acting as if there is no God. Totally numb to the, to the things that God says are right and the things that God says are wrong. And we're still guilty of this. Don't... Even Willie Nelson said it. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. I would say... Uh, so I get all my theology, my good theology from Willie. You can't let your daughters, and you can't let your sons be unequally yoked. That's the way the New Testament says it. You can't allow it. At least, and I know we don't control, and Savannah may do something foolish, and so might Caleb. I don't control them. But I'm going to sure guide them, and I'm going to sure fight for what I know is right, and I'm going to fight hard for what I know is right. I'm going to fight hard for God in my family to do what the Bible says is right. And so we see here in Samson, my goodness, Samson, from the very beginning of his life, I don't really care what God says. I don't really care that I'm a Nazarite, that I took that, that God gave me that vow. It's a very little concern to Samson. He's not focused on his role as a judge. He's not focused on the mission that God has called him for to start to cast off the Philistine oppression. All he sees is a pretty Philistine girl. He says, Daddy, Mommy, make her mine. Fool. Just a clown. Uh, just a clown. Verse 3, his mother and his father fight. Not very hard, but they fight. Then his father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all your people? They know the law. They're godly people. They know that the law says what I'm showing you on the board. We shall not intermarry with them. They're going to lead you away. You're going to worship their God, Samson. You're going to fail in life spiritually if you do that. God tells us that. So they say, Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among your people? that you go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? 
Interesting, when David meets Goliath later, what does he say? He calls him an uncircumcised Philistine. She remember, or she brings up this circumcision because not only is this a Gentile, but this is a non-Yahweh worshiping Gentile. This is a non-Jew. Remember, circumcision was a, a sign that God gave to Abraham that all the males shall be circumcised in the foreskin of their flesh to, to, their, to, to perform this rite as a recognition of the Abrahamic covenant. God made promises to Abraham, a land, a people, a kingdom. And if you understand it, if you're my people, be circumcised. That's the sign of the covenant. But these Philistines, non-Jews. So not only does she say they're un, they, these, this woman doesn't worship the, the one true God, but she calls her uncircumcised to show that this is a non-Jew, non-Yahweh worshiping woman. Not just a non-Jew. This isn't a color issue. This isn't a race issue. This is a spiritual issue. You're trying to marry a woman who doesn't worship your God. What are you doing? Stand up, parents and grandparents, the way that Samson's mother and father did. Is there nobody in Israel that you think is worthy to be a bride, that you've got to go outside of Israel to the Gentile, uncircumcised, non-Yahweh worshiping world, that you've got to go to the pagans and their false gods? That's where you go to find a wife? Really, son? These are previews of coming attractions in our conversation with one another, Caleb. But I doubt it. Caleb knows. Caleb knows. Savannah knows. Thank God. Samson chose a bride who is an unbeliever in Yahweh. She is an enemy of Yahweh and an enemy of Israel. And here the champion of Israel, Samson, chooses an enemy of Yahweh and an enemy of Israel. He's supposed to be their leader that leads them away from this enemy, leads them to destroy this enemy, and instead, what does he say? I want one of the enemy for my own bride. You just can't get any more clownish. It's just foolish, but it's beyond foolish. It's almost comical. That's why I call him a clown. He's just like this, the folly that he falls into is just like, oh my gosh, this non-thinking clown. Samson said to his father, get her, a command, an imperative. Commanding his father, get her for me. She looks good to me. It's just physical attraction. There's no spiritual, there's, there's no checklist. There's no, there's no uh, he needs to be this, he needs to be this, she needs to be this, she needs to be this. None of that. She looks good to my eyes. I want that one. Daddy, Make it happen. Astounding. <clears throat> also, a picture of arranged marriages, as I said, that he goes to his parents and says, you make it happen. He didn't go to her and ask her. They didn't elope. It wasn't done in the culture then at all. So Samson asked his parents to get this girl for him. Verse 4 said, How, or says, however, his father and mother didn't know that it was of the Lord. So his father and mother are putting up this fight to do what's right before the Mosaic law, what God has told them to do. What they don't know is that God is using this foolish decision of Samson to start picking at the Philistines. So God's allowing this. He's permitting Samson to make this bad decision because God is going to allow this event, Samson's bad decision, to further God's plan. He's going to pick at the Philistines. The war is going to become, the fighting with the Philistines is going to start. And he's got to do this because, as I said, Israel is happy living with the Philistines, living under the thumb of the, the rulership of the Philistines. They're totally at peace. God has to start this way. So it says his father and mother did not know that this was of the Lord, for he, the Lord, was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. And now at that time, the Philistines were ruling over Israel. So Yahweh has decided, God has decided, the Lord, it says, it's time for the Philistines to be punished. It's time for them to go down. I'm starting it now. 
So he allows again. Don't mistake this. God doesn't want Samson to break the Mosaic law. God doesn't want Samson to go against what God wants to marry an enemy of God and an enemy of Israel. God does not want Samson to marry a Philistine. It wouldn't be his choice. God's choice. But he allows it. Uh, we haven't talked a whole lot about the will of God, the different types of will of God, but sometimes God says, this is the way it's going to be, and that's it. There is no changing it. He decrees something to be, and it happens. And there's another time, another type of the will of God that's called His permissive will. He permits us to do things that He doesn't want us to do, and he weaves our bad decisions into his plan to move his plan forward. So here God says, it's time for the Philistines to be punished. Samson is going to marry this woman. I'm going to allow that because through his marriage to this Philistine, I'm going to start this battle. So Yahweh simply overrules man's foolishness here and disobedience. He overrules man's foolishness and disobedience so that he can bring his will to pass in spite of man's foolishness and disobedience. I hope that makes sense. We also see the great grace of God in this. He could have just uh, destroyed Samson. After all I've given you, the privilege, the opportunity, the, I, I sent the second person of the Godhead personally to your mother, walked with her on earth, to, to talk about you being born in the following year. After everything I've done for you, giving you God the Holy Spirit. Nobody in the Old Testament, not many of them, had God the Holy Spirit come alongside them. I've done everything for you. I've chosen you to be the judge. After everything I've done for you, this is the way you repay me? By marrying my enemy? But in God's great grace and mercy, He says, I'll allow it. I'm going to push through your foolishness. I'm going to write it into my eternal plan. And this is the way we're going to move forward. And he has to do that with us all the time. Every time we make decisions that are sinful and boneheaded, God has to write through that decision and work all things together for good because that's the way he does things. Verse 5, let's keep going a little bit. Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother, came as far as the vineyards of Timnah. We see a story within a story here. So Samson is traveling with his mom and his dad to go get this, this deal done on the marriage. And behold, it says a young lion came roaring toward him. How many of you could defeat a lion with your bare hands? The answer is none of us, not even close. But look what happened in Samson's life in verse 6. It says, The Spirit of the Lord, this is God the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson mightily so that Samson tore the lion as one tears a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. He did this barehanded. He just grabs this lion and kills it. Supernatural strength God the Holy Spirit gave him. So he killed it with nothing in his hand, but it says he didn't tell his father or mother what he had done. So we see here Samson fights a lion. He kills it with his bare hands. only reason he could do that is because God the Holy Spirit gave him the strength to do it. God the Holy Spirit came upon him, it says. Why would he do this? Why is this story in this book? What's God doing? I think the picture is this. Samson. I've raised you to be the judge and cast off the Philistine oppression. If you can do this to a lion with your bare hands with the help of God the Holy Spirit, you can do this to the Philistines. Focus on the mission. Focus on why I chose you, your parents. Focus on what we're doing here, the task at hand. Forget about the Philistine woman. Look at what we're doing here. Look at where we're going. Samson has gone to his mother and father and said, I want this Philistine woman. God intervenes the way he does in our lives so often. And he says, wake up. And he allows this event in Samson's life to say, wake up, Samson. Forget about the woman. Focus on the task at hand. Look what I just gave you the ability to do. 
Focus on the Philistine oppression. Focus on the enemy of God. Don't go join the enemy. Focus on the enemy. Focus on the task at hand. You can do to the Philistines what you did to this lion. He tries to get Samson's attention. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. I think that's exactly why that lion comes up. To get Samson's attention, to focus on God, to focus on his privilege, to focus on his mission. And, but what is Samson's mission? It's not God's mission. Samson's mission is his own mission. I want that pretty girl. I don't care who she is. Oh, Samson. So God intervenes personally in his life with this lion, and Samson just goes right over his head. No concern. Didn't stop him at all. Verse 7, so he went down. Instead of stopping and realizing what the lion meant in his life, he went down and he talked to the woman and she looked good to Samson. You know what that phrase is literally? She was right in his eyes. Remember this phrase in the book of Judges? In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. That's what it means here. That's what it says. That to Samson the woman was right in his own eyes. Didn't care about the Mosaic Law, didn't care about what God had to say, didn't weigh the Bible in his lifetime the way we should, didn't make decisions based on God's Word and what God wants out of our lives. He just liked it, so he did it. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. It says here, he went down, talked to the woman, she looked good to Samson, she was right in his eyes. I'm going to tell you one more story and we're going to stop. Can you think of any other man? Thinking about a man killing a lion. Samson's response to the killing of the lion was not what God intended. There really was no response. He just killed the lion. He looked at it, didn't tell his mother and father about it. Maybe he was fearful of this great power that had come upon him. What, how could I do that? Uh, there are lots, several reasons why he may not have told his mother and his father this great strength came upon him. But can you think of any other man, as we close here, can you think of any other man in the Bible who had an encounter with a, with a lion with his bare hands? David. King David, who is not born yet, comes later. But look what the Bible says about King David. I'm showing you this to show you how it impressed David. The way it impressed Samson, not at all. He didn't stop and thank God. There's nothing in there about Samson focusing on Yahweh after this event with the lion. David is entirely different. 1 Samuel 17, just three or four verses and we'll close. David said to Saul, his father-in-law, the first king of Israel is Saul. David's a young man and he says about himself, David is telling his own life story to Saul. Now what's going on here in 1 Samuel 17 is there is a Philistine named Goliath. And Goliath comes out every day in the valley of Elah. Goliath comes down the hill where the Philistine army is and he taunts the armies of the living God Israel and he says, send out a man to fight me. And days and days and days and weeks go by and nobody in Israel has the courage to go out and fight the nine foot, nine foot, nine inch tall giant Goliath. Except this little boy, David, this young kid, and this is what David says about the strength that God can give a man. Your servant, speaking of himself, me, I, was tending my father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him. One sheep. David, the picture of Jesus to come, when that one sheep goes away, he goes to look for the sheep. David says, When a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued the sheep from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Fearless kid. Because he knew he walked with God. Look what it says in the next verse. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, what did Samson's parents call her? 
Samson's choice of a bride, an uncircumcised Philistine, a hater of the one true God, Yahweh. David says the same thing. This man hates our God. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has taunted the armies of the living God. This isn't man against man. This is Goliath against Yahweh. And David says, I'll step in because Yahweh is going to give this victory. Look at what the killing of a lion did to David's life. Look at the next verse. David said, Yahweh. Whenever you see the Lord in all capitals, it's translating the Hebrew word Yahweh, which means He is. It's the name for God. Yahweh who delivered me. Who does David give all credit to? God. Who did Samson give credit to? No one. He just killed the lion and walked on. Didn't even tell his mother and father to honor God through what he's just done through me in the saving of my life by having giving me the strength to kill a lion. Nothing. Silence. What did David do? Tells the king of Israel, God did this. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Any fear? Any holding back in this young man's mind about going up against this 10-foot tall giant? Not a drop. And Saul said to David, Go, and may Yahweh be with you. And so we see exactly that. What is David's focus? My question, or, or my, the reason I took you here, is because where is David's focus? When he does something supernatural by the power of God, like kill a lion or a bear with his own hands, where is David's focus? Where is his gratitude? Where is his thanksgiving? Who is he looking toward? God. Always God. Samson? Ah. David, always God. Goliath is this idolatrous enemy of God and an enemy of Israel. He's an uncircumcised Jew and da- or uncircumcised Gentile. And David says, God wants him dead. And God will use me to do it. I have no fear. What an amazing, the the difference between the very same act that God can do in a person's life, in Samson's life, that had no effect on him, he does in David's life, and it has tremendous effect on King David. Not king yet, but the king to be. It changes his focus about what he's able to do walking with the living God. After this, David will say, I will go into battle with him because the battle is the Lord's. And we know David took those five little stones from the the creek, the dry creek that runs through the valley of Elah. He put them in his sling. The first stone he slung hit David right in the forehead, indented his forehead. He falls down and David goes and takes the the head off of Goliath with Goliath's own sword. Is there anything God can't do is the question. Samson would have said, God who? David said, there's nothing my God can't do. Totally different perspective. Exact same event. Unbelievable the way... uh, Well, I I could theologize, but I won't. Let's close in prayer. We'll pick up there next time. Be a David, not a Samson.